Esther's fine with that. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Ah, it's nice to be here. Uh, it's a weird room. It's like this very weird long room. Uh, so we're just here to have a chat and talk a bit about uh, our lives uh, and what we do and how we try to both work together and have impact in the world. Uh, we're going to try and leave some time for questions at the end, so please have questions. Um, I did not, unfortunately, print out my notes, so I'm going to use my phone. I apologize in advance. I'll start off easy, so let me start off with asking Esther. Um, tell us a little bit about what inspired you to be an economist and how you became an economist and how you started studying development, of all the things. Yeah, I, so I don't think I was set up to be an economist. I, it didn't actually never occurred to me uh, when I was growing up. Uh, in France, where I grew up, you do either math or uh, Greek and Latin, and, or maybe you're a doctor. Uh, but I didn't want to be a doctor. My mom is a doctor. But from a uh, uh, very early age, I was very uh, uh, bothered, literally bothered, by the fact that I was uh, living in this uh, sheltered, uh, comfortable life. and. Uh, other kids, by pure accident of birth, uh, ended up living in, in such worse circumstances. So my mother, who is a doctor, she um, was uh, very active in an NGO that uh, helped kids victim of wars around the world. So she was traveling uh, to these other countries and come back and show us some slideshows. At the time, it was this little square uh, slideshows. And then she would tell us, you know, this is your contribution to help kids who have a very different life to let me go. And I thought, that's okay, but that seems like a pretty small contribution. So it was always in a corner of my mind that I should uh, repay my cosmic debt to the world by uh, uh, <laughs> doing something uh, to, you know, meaningful to help those kids. Uh, but I didn't know what it could be for a long time. I was active and, you know, volunteering f wherever I could and, and um, so on. But I didn't see the two being connected uh, professionally for, for a very long time. And then I was in college and then towards my third year in college, I, f I felt that this contradiction between my sheltered life and my ambitions were not sufferable anymore and I had to do something uh, about it. So I thought maybe I would go into politics because then I could be active in the world or policy making, but I wasn't sure it was for me. I kind of liked the idea of being academic. So I thought, let me take one year off and I went to Russia for a year. And in Russia, I had met several important uh, people. So first of all, I, was, I ended up being hired as research assistant by groups of economists, several, in fact, warring groups in the, and I was working for them and I could see if, from very close by how influential they were. I could also see from very close by how they had no idea what they were doing. <laughs> Nobody had any idea, but, and, and it was a bit scary and, and very fascinating. And I also met uh, Thomas Piketty, who at the time was teaching at MIT. And he told me, you know, if you go and if you do economics at MIT, you will find it, it's very applied and you will be able to get the tools that will uh, be helpful to, uh, for you to work in the world. So I thought that's a good plan. And, uh, and that's how I became an economist. So I only became an economist when I, understood, or I or decided to become an economist. It took some time to actually realize it. When I, when I understood how uh, it could be a way of uh, merging my professional ambition to be an academic and suitability, frankly, uh, and my personal ambition to, to make a difference uh, in the world. Great, thanks. I think we're all really glad you're not a French politician, Esther. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, not just for us, but maybe also for France. <laughs> um, you've done a lot of work that thinks carefully about inequities, and global inequities in particular, and Dave mentioned all the areas you've worked on. Maybe you can give us an example of, you know, through j one of the biggest practical implementations of things you've worked on, anything you're, yeah, anything you think has kind of been one of the biggest things you're proud of? So I think that when early on, when I stumbled onto randomized evaluations uh, and I started running this uh, sort of clinical trial in the field to evaluate interventions, 
I had a pretty simple model in mind that you run a good trial, you get a good result, you prepare a, a shiny policy brief, you peddle it to policy makers, and your thing gets adopted. That's quite kind of my model. Um, and I discovered over the years that that's not how it works, and that the, 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 the policy influence, uh, such as it is, is, is much more, um, it's at the same time more difficult and uh, more impactful than going from one project to one adoption. The more difficult part is that um, nobody really wants to do what you tell them to do with good reasons. <laughs> because they, you know, they have their problems and their context and, and so on. So you can't really go from a, a template to adoption. It takes a lot of time. So we've done, for example, works on uh, um, teaching at the right level, which is ways of kind of uh, changing curriculum and the way they are implemented uh, to be more realistic about what kids know and, and tailor the, the teaching to what they know. And this is extraordinarily impactful as methods, but then it, it takes a lot of effort to persuade governments to, to get it done. So it really took years and years and years of persuading, but also uh, uh, changing the models and so on. And that eventually reached uh, uh, you know, millions of kids in, in, in uh, India where it started, but more interestingly in Africa where through uh, a, a, a new organization, Tal Africa, this Indian NGO is actually uh, translating the knowledge to many, many African countries. But then, and then more broadly, I also discovered, I think something that has happened that is harder to put a, a, a specific finger on, but it's really definitive, is how uh, governments in many developing countries have become so much more pragmatic. And I don't think it's just my, you know, by, by far, I we played a very small role in that, but we played a role in that in that, and when I say we, it's not me, it's like the whole of j movement and of course uh, uh, Tavnit. And by, by that I mean setting much more concrete goals, like, I don't know, reducing maternal mortality, and going at it with the tools that are likely to be effective and testing them out and moving. And I think this has changed the last uh, 20 or 30 years much more fundamentally than any particular intervention in its adoption. So the way we count in JPAL, we have, a, we, have we, we count that indirectly we've touched about uh, 550 million lives through programs that any of our affiliates has shown to be effective and were scaled up. Uh, but um, uh, I think it's also broader than just this bean counting is this, this spirit. But let me now go back to <laughs> Uh, turn the question back to you, Tevnit, and it, this couldn't have happened without a, a movement of, uh, of people. This is what we said from the very first day of the Nobel Prize. This is not for us. This is a movement, a movement of uh, thousands of researchers, people in the field, NGOs, governments, and one part of this movement that you've been so much, you've spent so much time building is, is African academics, and I think it would be a useful uh, story to tell. Uh, to people. Thanks, Esther. Yeah, I guess that's one of the things I think we're all at j really excited about is, you know, like Esther says, it's a movement, but um, it hasn't been as inclusive of a movement as we have liked. And so over the last few years, uh, in spite of COVID, I think, we've built a, an agenda to try and actually reach out to academics on the ground so that it is truly a global movement, not a movement just here. And so one of the things uh, the Africa team uh, has been building over the last few years, with of course help from Jay Powell's central uh, administration, or governance I guess is the right word, is trying to get funding to African academics and try to create better collaborations. Like the two things they're missing is kind of mentoring over how to use randomized control trials because this is kind of a, a new set of methodologies in economics, plus the money. This is all really expensive, as you can imagine. We collect a lot of data, we spend a lot of time on the ground, and this all actually costs a lot of money. And so we've built both a mentoring and a funding pipeline for African academics. I think we're up at close to 50. I don't think I even told you this. 
one of our research initiatives I run, which is a digital ag initiative, it's a brand new initiative at JPAL, we kind of put out an RFP and this RFP just is just coming in right of as of last week and 80% of the proposals are from academics in South Asia and Africa. Um, you know, there was one proposal from the US and I was like, wow. So, you know, that's been a big part of kind of trying to take very seriously what Esther and Abhijit said when they got the Nobel, which is it's a movement. Well, then, you know, it needs to be a global movement. And I think we've, we have a responsibility to make it that. And so for me, that's the exciting part of what's coming next. Thanks, Esther. Okay, let me ask you something slightly different um, and shift gears. We've been colleagues and peers in academia for a while. Uh, um, you know, I wanted to spend a couple minutes to talk about a bit about how Esther has both influenced me and challenged me. Um, I came to MIT not having done a randomized control trial ever. Uh, and having done a, a dissertation that was absent all of those, I guess in the earlier days of, of JPAL, and started working with the Poverty Action Lab very closely, Rachel Glenister, who was the director then, Esther, Abhijit, Michael. Um, and it's been a huge, huge impact on both how I do research and how I think about the world and how a lot of our field does research. I think when I was in graduate school, development was thought of as a macro kind of how do countries grow field and not really thinking about how do we make policymakers in these countries effective? And that shift has been huge. Um, I think what Esther's challenged me to do is, is kind of um, help with bits of JPAL. I think the Africa Scholars piece was a challenge from them. Um, and given how much I spend time on the ground in Africa and work there and actually am from there, um, I think that was a, a big challenge from Esther to try and do something. So hopefully we'll meet that in the future. Um, so I just wanted to say that it's, it's been great. Um, I, I would ask Esther, you know, how do you think peers and collaborations are important to this whole enterprise and agenda? And, you know, extrapolating to our alums here, how do you think we can both support and challenge each other? Yeah, I think if we had one insight uh, that is important, uh, well, maybe one insight is that one could use randomized control trial on the field and actually do it, that I will credit Michael and Abhijit for. Uh, but subsequently, I think, and maybe that's that I will take a little more credit for that one, share it with them, but take my piece of that credit, is the idea that um, um, you're so much more powerful as a network. So I think what happened with the, with the creation of JPAL uh, is worth mentioning. So at some point, uh, both Sandil Mulanathan, who is now in Chicago, or the three of us, Sandil, uh, Abhijit, and me, all, that, all had offers to be teaching elsewhere. That happened from time to time to academics. And at this point, what you typically do uh, is to try to get more money for yourself and some more research money and, and so on. And we are like, oh, okay, we are not going to let this <laughs> opportunity go to waste. We want to do something more meaningful. And uh, thanks to the incredible support of everyone in the in our hierarchy, starting with our head of department, Bank Ulmström, with the dean of the CHES, the, the Humanity of uh, Social Science, which is our school, and uh, up to the provost. And then I'll tell you about the president in a, in a minute. Uh, there were support for what we proposed, which is, OK, we are not going to, we don't want just uh, a few hundred thousand dollars to do a center. We want to start building a network of people uh, across all the universities who, do, who use this kind of method. And we want to be able to leverage that network to do what academics are not very good at doing, which is uh, 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 translate the research to policymakers, get the questions to policymakers, and generally find ways to make ourselves useful. So generally, the academic thinking is not just about topic, it's also about the production function of you write your paper, you try and get it published, that takes some time, and then it's finished, it's filed in a drawer. And we wanted to help with that piece, but we didn't want just to help us, we wanted to help a network. And at the beginning, it was a bit overambitious to call this a network because we were eight people <laughs> in the network. 
but they were not all at MIT. <laughs> And uh, they were, it was all, you know, always a network of people in various institutions, uh, initially quite US-based. We had one Indian uh, uh, scholar in our first, uh, in our first uh, 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 group of people. But I think that insight turned out to be essential because it's from that idea that you don't, you know, you don't start uh, uh, just uh, you know, cultivate your own garden, but you, 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 you tend to a forest <laughs> of people and there might not be any immediate benefit to us at any given point. And we can in instead have the idea that we're spending a lot of time creating public goods that we don't see like the direct impact for us in our direct professional lives. And then suddenly it explodes and then after 15 years, now or almost 20 years, you turn back and say, oh, there is 1,000 researchers in our network and they are starting to be all over the world. And it's about translating the research into action, which is our motto and how we started from. But it's also about making the research better. And this is what Devnit insisted on, which is helping people to understand how these projects are run. Uh, giving the infrastructure, putting the infrastructure in place to make it possible. The young people now, they don't realize, the young scholars, they don't realize that running a, a randomized control trial is not just pressing a button and JPL will hire the staff for you <laughs> and will train them and will fire them when it's needed and so on and so forth. That we, Tavnit and I, we like collected every single data point by hand. <laughs> And so we like to look a little bit uh, scrouchy. Well, you know, days we were. But this is a result of having that network. Just to, you know, in in South Asia, mostly in India, at any given point in time, we have 1,500 people on the on the ground. And when COVID happened, I think we <laughs> like we had 1,500 staff members. Yeah. And that's not something that any single academic, that includes me, could deal with. But that's something that, as the organization we have built, I was able to, to, to deal with. So this network thing, it turns out to be, this is what has made our strength uh, globally, and I think has made it possible to, to succeed. Yeah, and I think it's the same across the world. I think the Kenya group is almost seven, 800 staff on the ground. Um, yeah, I think the collaborations are key. Now that you mentioned the field, maybe I should ask you something lighter, which was, What's, what, you know, what's your favorite research project? And maybe can I ask your favorite field story? As Esther said, when this started, um, it was very much a hands-on enterprise for us. Yes, we're the grumpy old people now who go, you, you guys have it so good. You, don't, you have all this like, stuff. You have staff who help you. And we, we were out there trying to build bits of this infrastructure at the time. It certainly has a lot of, uh, of, of, of great stories. So the first time I got to Kenya, I lost my, um, my suitcase uh, on the way. It didn't come and, uh, uh, in, in Busia, Kenya, and it never came. So I was kind of uh, uh, figuring out like, how to do it. And at some, after two, three days, um, one uh, uh, of our area pulled me aside and said, you, you, we have to get you clothes. Like people in Kenya are properly dressed. So you cannot <laughs> wear the same grubby jeans that you traveled on. Nobody's going to take you seriously. And we went mar like shopping for, for, for skirts in the market and, and so on. So that was, that was an example. Um, still involving clothes, uh, several years ago, uh, um, Ian Parker from The New Yorker wrote a, a profile uh, about me. And for that, he, he followed me around for a couple of weeks. One of these weeks was uh, we were together. In, yes, I remember this story. In, uh, in Rwanda. <laughs> and first of all, we were taking him everywhere, and he, he didn't understand what was on him. Yeah. Ian is known, very nice guy, he's become, uh, subsequently became a friend of mine. But he's known for hatchet jobs. So I think he had been delivered to me to do a hatchet job on me. I don't know why they wanted to do a hatchet job on me. But thanks to Tavnit and the field in Rwanda, we, uh, we actually turned him into a huge fan and he wrote an extraordinarily <laughs> positive article in the New Yorker. And then after that... Uh, well, the best part of the story was the New Yorker wanted to get a photograph of Esther in the field. And they'd sent this photograph. Across, she, so she was in India and somewhere else and then came into Kenya and then we went into Rwanda. And this photographer was following around and missing her everywhere. Mm. So they finally said, are you in Rwanda for a couple of days? And we're like, we're here for a week. We're in the field. And we were actually, we're now writing up the work from, <laughs> which is a while. But, 
we were in the field talking to customers <coughs> and they're like, okay, we're sending the photographer out. So they send him out and we're in the middle of absolutely nowhere in Rwanda. <coughs> and Esther's wearing black pants and a black shirt, like, well, black jeans and a black shirt. And he goes, I don't, black doesn't look good on photographs. <laughs> and we're like, we're in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. She's got black, that's all that's happening. And I was wearing all black, so it's not like we could trade clothes. <laughs> and so we're like, this is it. This is what you got, buddy. And he goes, they really don't look good. And we had um, <laughs> the NGO we were with, um, the partner, this was Chris Jordan, remember? Chris was with us, and he was wearing this blue and white striped shirt. And the photographer said, that shirt would look good on her. <laughs> <laughs> and so Chris gladly was like, Fine, I'll trade, I'll, I'll give you my shirt for your photograph for the New Yorker. <laughs> and so Esther <laughs> is wearing Chris's shirt for these photographs. Because um, we were really far from the city where all our stuff was. There was no other option. I remember that very well. And, and Mark, so, so we have plenty of those. The, I think the, the, the deeply is the, and, and I must say with COVID, I've been, Miss tremendously going to the to the field uh, because this is where we get also our insights. Uh, so, for example, I uh, I remember in spending a lot of time in Kenya uh, uh, trying to understand why people aren't using fertilizer, and we were originally uh, this is actually something Tavni we were also doing was doing our dissertation about, and in our work. Uh, we were originally focusing on um, information and uh, the, the technology of fertilizer. I think maybe people don't understand how it's, it's being used and maybe we need to show them. We were doing demonstration plots and uh, um, tracing the, trying to understand whether if one farmer is trained, they'll continue to use it or their neighbors will continue to use it. And all that is interesting and it, you know, it's, it's useful and it's certainly a part of the story. But by being in the field, through conversation with the farmers, we, we realized that there was something else and, and that a lot of the people who do understand the use of fertilizer, who would, find, who would know how to use it, who would find it profitable, they, they, don't, they can't do it because they never have the money at the right time. And I really distinctly remember a conversation with someone because I was like, how come you don't have money? Fertilizer costs very little and you can buy as little as you want. It's available in smaller quantities at the shop nearby. You, why don't you buy just a little and do a little on your plot and then you could buy a little more and do it. And, uh, and this, through this conversation, it was like, well, that's not really practical. You're not going to try and understand the whole thing to do uh, so little. It's really a change in mindset. So we need to have more money and then through this conversation, we had the idea of developing a program where of finding them when they have the money, which is at harvest time, and allowing them to pre-purchase the fertilizer at that time and deliver it when they need it. And this idea I would never have had without the conversation we're having on the field because we were to start with on an entirely different trajectory and in our economist mind had not been thinking that the financing would be an issue for something which is... Uh, divisible and therefore can be uh, acquired in very, very small quantity. So that's something which might be familiar to some of you if you're in business, which is basically you know, talking to your clients, so to speak. <laughs> in, uh... Yeah, and I think that's a really important part of something we've learned over time. A lot of us get our ideas from interacting with people in the field, not from, unfortunately, sitting in our offices at MIT. Um, and I think that translates quite broadly these days, the context and the environment and the people making decisions in those contexts and environments matter. And it matters so much that the solution you think of is gonna be completely different if you engage with that context, those people in that environment very directly yourself. Uh, as Esther said, during COVID, we've really missed being in the field. Um, it, I think that's been kind of one of the biggest transitions for us and having to stop field projects, but also just not feeling inspired by you know, trying to be around people, context, environments we're studying. So um, I am on sabbatical next year and we'll be in the field. Um, I think we will try, I think we only have 10 minutes left. So I would like to see if there's any questions from the audience that we can take. Yeah. Uh, right at the end. 
class of 99, fantastic conversation. Congrats on your prize. Uh, maybe just that last point, I'd love for you to connect back, you know, the eff maybe the effect of entrepreneurship um, that you're seeing in the field, meaning how do people do this for themselves? And, or maybe the entrepreneurial method that you were talking about, the, you know, the whole idea, just like the scientific method, there's an entrepreneurial method of finding product market fit, right? Or finding these insights on the field. Just your commentary on, on that. Yeah, I can take a shot and feel free to add, Esther. <clears throat> I think a lot of our work has involved partners. We don't, we work as the network, as Esther mentioned, the network has about a thousand academics in the network now but it also has probably equal numbers of partners. I don't know, Esther, some version. You know, I do a lot of work on tech products in Africa. I work with the telecommunications company, with banks. The nice thing is, you know, in developing countries, those organizations don't have R&D arms. They're not like the telco or, the, you know, big companies here that have an R&D arm. And so they kind of see us as playing that R&D arm for them. Right? We can help you play and mess around with some of your products in a small space of your life, not the entire organization, but it can, and together with their teams, right? We sit with their product managers or their kind of staff and try to play around with kind of thinking through the context, the environment, and, and trying to create with them. Um, and then test, 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 right? So I think that's been the nice part, at least for my engagements, especially with the private sector in Africa. It's been very much this notion that we can start to help them play what an R&D arm would do, but also build their staff. So I, you know, I also helped train one of the telcos having a data science team that could do some of this on their own, because I'm not there all the time. And they probably want to do things that are also pretty bread and butter that are not as creative or innovative as we would like. And the combination is what's gonna make the company better, right? And so I think it's really both integrating yourself into the environment and the context, but also trying to bring a bit of this kind of experimental, kind of creative or kind of testing flair to it that a lot of places don't quite have yet because they don't have the ability to think about it, right? Hi, Jean Hammond. I, I wanted to ask a question about the methodology a little bit because I've always been concerned that whenever we try to do these sort of um, dosage, non-dosage trials, that the uh, externalities are so complex that it's almost impossible to understand, you know, what all the issues are. You know, did that kid walk to school through a gang zone? And that's why the math product isn't as effective as the as the kid that didn't. And and what is it? How? And you seem to have spent this conversation describing that you have to keep bringing all of these complexities into the models over and over and over again. Great, that's what we need to do. But is there something wrong with the method also that uh, that the complexity is too great on this class of subjects? And um, so I'm just interested in how you think about that uh, complexity in, in, in the mix of issues that you're facing. Well, mostly I'd say that the, 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 randomizer, the randomization is the only way to, uh, to, put, uh, to, to possibly uh, deal with that complexity. That's precisely where it becomes helpful is that uh, in, in the absence of, you know, in the, in the absence of on randomization, if you want to try and evaluate a program, let's say a math program in schools, uh, there are any number of reasons why the schools have taken up that program. So it could be because uh, uh, they are very, very poor and that's why they got selected. Then you have this problem that the kids are different. Or it could be on the contrary that uh, it's the most enterprising uh, uh, manager of the school that took up this new program and therefore the kids would be doing well anyway. So that's precisely to cut through this noise that the randomization is helpful, is because we now take a sample of schools who are different from each other, but you know, the sample is sufficiently large that they all experience some of a gang zone and some don't, and some have an enterprising policy maker and some don't. And then in that large sample, if you randomize, uh, then there is no reason why the treatment schools are different from the control school, except for the fact that you've introduced the intervention. So 
in that large sample is where uh, uh, the, you know, the bodies are buried, which is that the, the, the samples will need to be larger if the complexity is larger. This is what we try and capture by uh, uh, pre-survey to figure out how much viability there is in the conditions, how much uh, of a sample we need to, to collect to, uh, to collect to uh, make sure that we will be able to even out in, in, in when the sample is large enough. And contrary to medical trials, just to finish, we work in very, very large samples. So Well, they'll need the, that's why they need our help. Uh, that's right. uh, so uh, the way we, the way we, uh, so the you know the, the the websites of the world are able to do it uh, 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 because websites people change all the time. So even if a small website could uh, do A/B testing pretty much on their own, once you start experimenting with uh, uh, you know real field conditions. Uh, you, generally, that's what's happening in NGOs, which is they can have ideas, they, they pilot it, they bring to a stage where it's plausible, and then they need money, and they need uh, technical capacity, and so on, and that's where we come in. And why is it helpful for us to come in, and why someone wants to pay for it? It's because if a good idea emerges, there is enormous value to the rest of the, of the world. And so a public good is being generated by, by the knowledge that's being generated through the trial, even if it doesn't work. So that's the thing with social innovation, like technical innovation, not everything works. Uh, but when things work, they work enough to potentially generate huge uh, uh, human value, social welfare, and in our, so we, we like to think in a portfolio way, it's like across our portfolio, uh, there are many failures, and it's okay, because such is life. Uh, but there are enough things that work to have changed the life of, of millions and hundreds of millions of people through just a few that happen to have been successful. And that's enough for funders to be interested in funding our work and for researchers to do it and for young people to want to work on this project and so on and so forth. I'll add one quick thing, which is I think even the failures are valuable to us. Finding something doesn't work and trying to get governments to stop paying for things that don't work is equally useful, right? So even some of the things we find that don't work, if we're working with a partner or a government who's trying to do that, it can actually be quite valuable. Yeah, it's also true the things that don't work to eventually get to the thing that work. Yeah. I was talking about teaching at the right level before. That only came after many of the usual things uh, like providing inputs, textbooks, computers, flip charts, whatever, uh, cutting class size, uh, uh, paying, you know, all of this didn't lead to the results that we hoped for, that we kind of boost the combination of the researchers, the field insights, the partners, and so on, came up with what is really ailing in the education system and therefore how to go and address it. So it's through a combination of these projects that, that you get to the right thing. It's really one like brilliant innovation coming out of just nowhere. This is more about discovery than about innovation in the sense of a small, like one traditional innovative product. I think we have time for one more question, right? Yeah. I think there's a mic behind you. Thank you. Hi, Rachel Card, uh, and I have an ME degree from here as well. Um, I love this conversation, and I find it incredibly fascinating and timely. Um, to get a little more specific, when you look out at opportunities, with the emerging trend of massive decentralization across the globe, which I believe has the impact to empower us through our own data again, are you thinking about how that you can leverage that technology and kind of Web3 and blockchain to maybe be more efficient more transparent and leverage kind of AI to be able to get less, leverage the hands-on ability you have for more people around the globe? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, do you, I'm happy to take it. Do you want to take it? No, Let me start. Go ahead. <laughs> I, 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 I think, you know, I, at least I work in a part of the world where we are so far from that at the moment. We don't have databases. 
let alone blockchain, right? I need a database first, right? I don't even have an IBM basic 101 database, right? One of the things we have now, a new initiative at JPAL on is, um, aside from databases, governments are trying to use biometrics to identify people. So for example, a lot of African countries have set up voter registers that use biometrics because there's a lot of ballot box stuffing. I know we never think about that here, but um, so, but these biometric, these biometric authentic, uh, authenticators or identifiers allow you to do other things. I can now prove who I am in a bank, which I couldn't before because I didn't have a birth certificate, I didn't have a passport, I didn't have an ID, but now I have an ID and with my biometrics they can prove, oh yeah, this is actually Tevneet, it's not someone else pretending to be Tevneet. So we have a huge research agenda that just started Unfortunately, COVID has you know, slowed all of us down, but it started right before COVID on digital IDs in Africa. And how do we start to understand both these biometric IDs? And then when we have databases, now we can start to think about, okay, what do we do with this? But we also have to think about how do we protect it and how do we do data protection laws? And so this is a very active research space for us now because a lot of countries are doing this and we're trying to work with government saying, wait, wait, wait. Before you hook up this ID to every, so Kenya planned to hook it up to banks, your cell phone, your taxes. I was like, wait, wait, wait. We might want to slow down and just think carefully about testing bits of this before we decide to hook up everybody to everything with the government holding this, this database, right? And so we've been trying to build small collaborations with governments doing this now in Africa to try and test these digital ID systems as you connect them to things, how do we protect the data? How do we, and then I think we can get to your point now, we have data to be able to harness what people can, can choose for themselves. Can they you know, choose between healthcare systems instead of having to go to the one next door because that's the only one they know? Can they make choices based on better and more integrated information on quality and all these things? So I think that's to come down the road. I think we're really at least in the parts of the world I work in, it's quite different in India, uh, starting to build the, the systems that might allow us to build the data that will then allow us to do. But I think care is needed at every step. And so we've been trying to get involved early rather than later with the idea that this can be, you know, this is another place where we can try and provide these assets and resources and this idea of testing before you try to do everything all the time. I think at the sort of more stepping back one step, uh, it's uh, whenever new technology emerge, there is an enormous amount of enthusiasm and uh, hype uh, around it. And uh, the um, sort of the path of development and of this of, of uh, life of the poor in poor countries is littered with uh, uh, failure of these things, which again makes sense, you know, not everything succeeds. So, and I think we have no idea now what, so if I, I don't like to make predictions because I made a very successful career not making predictions. But <laughs> I make one anyway. Some of this technology will catch on, that's my first one. And the second one is you don't know which one. And, uh, and so, and no, neither do I. <laughs> um, and the way to, to do this is to be mindful and to try things out and to see what are the impact on what you expect to see and what are the intended impact and so on. And there I'll maybe, uh, it's, it's good time for a plea, which is, you know, there is a lot of enthusiasm also about ESG more generally and about, uh, you know, trying to invest in things that have good social impact and, uh, Strangely enough, the, the ESG sector is totally behind public policy and governments and NGO in the rigor which we, with which it evaluates uh, the impact of what it is investing on. So it's not yet in the blockchain, but there are you know, there were other things like in, you know the decentralized energy grids and. Uh, before that was microfinance and uh, and then micro insurance in between and so on and millions of, of dollars flow into these things and everything, everybody does the, the same thing and then research slowly catches on and we're like, well, actually there is no social benefit to any of that. And then meanwhile, you know, other things suddenly, uh, other things turn out to be hugely impactful. The cell phone is one, uh, mobile money is, is another. 
Uh, but you know, it's one of many, and not necessarily the one. I mean, mobile money did get support early on, but more, if I'm not wrong, by the gates uh, of the world than by the ESG, which I guess at the point was. So and uh, um, so my plea here is, if you are in this sector, is just uh, we are trying in, in Japan. In fact, we have we have trying to, to to find a way to connect to the sector. Uh, in a way that is like, let's do what for ESG, what we've done for public policy, which is slowly develop a, a, a toolkit of things that, you know, if you're gonna invest in ESG, you can invest in. And that takes some time. That takes trying out the things. It, it's a bit slow. You have to see what are the imp where the impacts are and so on. Uh, but it would, I think it would eventually save many, many years and, you know, in, in in bad ideas that get rolled out and everybody goes into and then you go back and you do something something different so so now would be a good time for mindfulness in in the in the ESG sector and probably something you can take take home yeah i'll give one final funny story on cell phones when cell phones started i remember my advisor telling me these are going to be revolutionary in africa and i laughed at him and i said you don't understand the continent there's no electricity, there, all these problems. People are not educated, and I am pleased to say I was proved absolutely wrong and have now done lots of research on the value of cell phones in this context. So it just sort of reiterates what Esther was saying. Your advisor being Chris. Yeah. So this good time to her advisor, who turned out to be my mentor just because he self-appointed himself, uh, because when I... <laughs> I didn't know that. When I uh, graduated from MIT, I stayed at MIT, and he took me aside and he said, you know what, that's not very good for you, but you know, come to Yale for a few weeks, and <laughs> it's instead oh, I think that's a the good, first time I met a you. A good maybe. friend and a mentor, and he actually, it's a good time, so give credit to him for, he is the one who went to the field. He spent his graduate school years, one year in Nigeria, recorded by hand every single transaction uh, between people who were doing informal credit between each other. And, and, and he has had a transformational impact on all of us just by doing yeah. that, showing it was mentoring. possible and mentoring a generation of people. So just take the advantage to, <laughs> to brace it. Um, I think we're officially out of time. So let me say thanks to Esther for being here. Thank you all for being here this morning. Thank you so much. What a way to start the day. There is so much to learn from this conversation. I think I took two important things away. The first is the importance of being in the field and we really, and how much we've missed that the past couple of years. And I hope that you use this time today here with each other to act as if we are in the field because that's what we're doing. And the second is to always carry a second change of clothes in your carry-on baggage. <laughs> <laughs> Can we have another round of applause for Esther and Tevney? Just a couple logistical items. Uh, lunch will be back in this room, but at this point, you're going to go downstairs one floor to the sixth floor to our breakout sessions. As you move through the breakout sessions, you'll notice that they are in three categories. They're focusing on the global, organizational, and individual levels. So you hope you, we all, you all find something that is uh, relevant to you right now. There's also a headshot studio on the sixth floor. So if you are in the market for a new one, you all look great today. I recommend you take advantage. And we recommend you take advantage of the breaks in between each session and lunch, all of which are not programmed to really use that time to meet each other. And we will start the next breakout session at 10.10. So please be down on the sixth floor on time so we can have our speakers have plenty of time to talk. Thank you so much. <laughs>